Hey team, Dr. Jack Gordy, and in my previous few videos, I covered how the immune system works, how it can fight disease, and then how it can go wrong. And I looked at how inflammation can contribute to disease. Well, the inflammation is about how the innate immune system primarily can contribute to disease. But now we're going to look at the autoimmune diseases. And in this, it's the adaptive immune system that is contributing to disease. So uh, let's jump into it. But first, I just want to talk about this figure. Autoimmune disease is when your own immune system seems to attack a component within yourself. Rather than attacking a pathogen, it starts to attack your own body. And in this fluorescent recent image here the autoimmune disease is called lupus and it's when your immune system starts to attack your very own dna so in green we can see the dna these are the nuclei of the cells and we can see that these dna these nuclei down here do not look particularly healthy and it's because they're being attacked by the immune system and that is an autoimmune disease called lupus but, but i'm getting way ahead of myself let's do a quick catch up on the uh, adaptive immune system so the adaptive immune system is made up of lymphocytes which are primarily um, T cells and B cells, those are the two major cell types of the adaptive immune system, and they make up 20 to 40 percent of your white blood cells. Um, now, one of the major players of the adaptive immune system is the T helper cell. Now, the T helper cell has a T cell receptor, and that T cell receptor can only recognize a very small number of antigens. And so in your body right now, you sort of have T helper cells, each with their own unique T cell receptor, which can each deal with a very small number of antigens and thus a very small number of pathogens, right? And what they do is uh, they go looking for professional antigen presenting cells like monocytes, macrophages, that have eaten a pathogen and are now displaying that pathogen on the surface. If this T cell receptor recognizes that antigen, the, the, uh, that was taken from this pathogen, it will now release cytokines to coordinate that immune response here, right? Now, if this always makes making sense to you, you better go back and watch those previous videos that cover the adaptive immune system. And another cell, obviously, is the B cell of the adaptive immune system. Each B cell has an antibody on its surface, and that's called a B cell receptor. And each B cell has a unique antibody displayed on its surface. And that unique antibody can only recognize one of a very few antigens. Again, it's very similar to that T cell receptor. And so they can only deal with perhaps one or maybe a few pathogens when being exposed to it. And so you have a, a whole range of very unique B cells all throughout your body, which are each best at attacking a very few number of pathogens or perhaps even only one. And so what happens is the antibody will bind to an antigen from that pathogen. And then we need a second signal from that T helper cell releasing cytokines. And that will tell the B cell to proliferate. So now the B cell will divide and divide and divide. And now it'll pump out those antibodies. And remember, those antibodies will bind to and coat the pathogen. So it now can't really function as a pathogen and it will die and it will get eaten by macrophages, for example. And then there's another cell, the cytotoxic T cell. Now, it has a T cell receptor a lot like the T helper cell that can only recognize a very few numbers of antigens. And so it's only really designed to deal with a very small number of pathogens. Um, and what it does is it binds to an antigen presenting cell, but this time on normal cells throughout your body, not a professional antigen presenting cell, but things like lung epithelia. Now, if it recognizes that basically it releases, if it recognizes the antigen that is being displayed by this cell, it will now release cytotoxic and apoptotic inducing compounds to kill that cell. So this guy just goes around and kills cells that have um, antigens inside of them that, rec that are bad. So in this one, we've got viral protein antigens inside that lung epithelial cell. Now, remember, the virus is inside the cell. So antibodies are really going to struggle to get to that virus. So we need to kill that cell to get the virus out so then antibodies can deal with it. So that's what the cytotoxic T cells can do. 
So autoimmune disease is where these recognition molecules, the T-cell receptor or the antibody, or both, um, recognize a self-antigen. So a protein or a carbohydrate that's produced or another biological molecule that's produced by your own body, and it recognizes it as a pathogen antigen. So it thinks that it is from a pathogen. And there are numerous types, and the, the, the different types of the disease depend on which part of the body it attacks. So type 1 diabetes, it attacks the pancreas, rheumatoid arthritis, it attacks the joints, lupus, it attacks seemingly the whole body in different places depending on the patient, multiple sclerosis, it attacks your neuron, your well, actually your insulation around your neurons, and there are many, many more. Almost if you can think of something in your body, there is an autoimmune disease um, that corresponds to it. So let's look at some of the mechanisms by how this works. And it's all to do, um, it's to do with multiple things, but one thing it's to do with is how your adaptive immune cells are created and sorted. And there's a key step here called negative selection. So your adaptive immune cells start as pre-B cells and T cells, and this is when they're not unique. They're not unique little flowers. They don't have their own um, antibody or T cell receptor yet. And what happens is there's a genetic shuffling process. If you want to know more details about that, check out my advanced immunology playlist, which jumps into this process, which is really, really cool. So after this genetic shuffling, each B cell and T cell is A, both genetically unique compared to the rest of the cells in your body, which is super interesting, and they will have their unique antibody and their unique um, T cell receptor. Now this is essentially random, and so they could often create an antibody or a T cell receptor that doesn't recognize a pathogen, it recognizes a self antigen. This should happen very often because the T cell receptor and antibody are genetically shuffled randomly right it's a, it's a very random process so they don't know what pathogen they like how could you have a b cell that's perfect for producing antibodies to target and kill SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 when your body has never seen it right so Basically, the answer is you produce receptors and antibodies at random, and randomly one of them, one of those antibodies or a few of those antibodies will be able to bind and target SARS-CoV-2. Now, if um, there is no problems, if there's no activation of the B cell, no activation of the T uh, cell receptor, so there is no nothing binds to the receptor or the antibody at this stage, they will then leave their maturation uh, place, the place in the body where they become mature, and they will go out into the circulatory system and into your lymph nodes. For the T cell, it's the thymus, that's why they're called T cells. For the B cells, it is the bone marrow, but that's not why they're called B cells. <laughs> but uh, it just so happens that that's where they mature in the bone marrow. <clears throat> Good way to remember it though, B cells, bone marrow, T cells, thymus. But if they are spontaneously activated, right, so there are no pathogens around at this stage, those receptors and those antibodies should not have a binding partner. So if something binds to their receptor or their antibody, they will get activation of that receptor and that will signal for them to die because they're not mature, they're not out in the periphery, that tells them to undergo apoptosis and die. This is negative selection. If the receptor or the antibody bind to something when there's no pathogens around, you know, this is just development inside the bone marrow or thymus, then th there's nothing there that should be binding to that and activating it. So if it does, if it binds and activates it, it self-signals for apoptosis. So they undergo suicide. They essentially commit suicide if they recognize that self-antigen. Now, a negative selection failure is when they do recognize the self-antigen, but they get released into the periphery anyway and go into the lymph nodes. They didn't get that signal that they shouldn't have done that. So now they're out in the periphery ready to respond to um, an autoantigen, a self compound, a self mo molecule. And this is when autoimmune disease can trigger. Now, there's also another, now and importantly, B cells are really the heart of autoimmune disease. Like antibodies are one of the major things for autoimmune disease, but T cells are there too. Now, importantly, you need a T helper cell and a B cell to recognize an antigen. Remember, if we go back to beep, 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 
if we go back to this, in order for a B cell to proliferate and to pump out antibodies, you pretty much need a T cell there releasing cytokines saying, I have also recognized the antigen. See how it's recognized the antigen there? So you need an activated T cell and an activated B cell in order to get proliferation. So you need a failure and negative selection in both your T cells and B cells in order to really get this autoimmune response. I think the T cell contribution to autoimmunity was underappreciated until very recently in the literature. Anyway, let's continue. There was a little side note. Oh, I went too far bus. Okay. But there's another process that we think also contributes to autoimmunity, and this is called molecular mimicry. So let's say, you know, you're 30 years old, you don't have an autoimmune disease, and then you get an infection. Now, this infection could be bacterial or viral. We don't know. It could be fungal. Um, but in that pathogen, um, we get all the normal processes going on. An antigen, the pathogen is eaten. The antigen is displayed. This activates a T helper cell. The antigen is also recognized by an antibody. The cytokines and the antibody recognition causes that B cell to proliferate and activate, right? So that's all completely normal. But what happens if that antigen there, that's on that um, on that pathogen on that bacteria in this case looks very similar like molecularly speaking is very similar to an antigen a self antigen now the immune system may become confused it's been infected with a pathogen it knew it was a pathogen because the pattern recognition receptors were activated it was releasing PAMPs um, we had tissue damage, for example, and we recognized its antigens and we dealt with it perfectly by producing antibodies. Maybe even cytotoxic T cells got involved. It was a perfect immune response. Nothing normal, nothing abnormal happened. But then we've got these antibodies around and these T cells around that can now recognize an antigen that's incredibly similar to our antigens. Now, in this case, I've got fibroblasts here that have released collagen, which is what makes up our cartilage. And this cartilage antigen looks incredibly similar on a molecular level to this bacterial um, antigen here. Now we can end up with an adaptive immune response to our own collagen. And this is, in fact, what rheumatoid arthritis is. Now, we don't know if a pathogen um, is solely responsible for rheumatoid arthritis. We think molecular mimicry may have a feature, but definitely also a failure and negative selection has a feature because there is a genetic component to rheumatoid arthritis. And so um, these environmental factors, exposure to antigens, exposure to pathogens, as well as these genetic factors seem to conspire to cause um, these autoimmune diseases, which is why they can seem to come out of nowhere. You could be 30, you could be 40, and suddenly you end up with an autoimmune disease. Um, and here we can see um, that it can attack the cartilage, uh, the immune system can attack the cartilage so severely that the structure of the joints begin to fail. Now, rheumatoid arthritis is particularly aggressive and it particularly affects the fingers often um, but it can affect other joints but it often uh, presents in the fingers and it causes these sort of um, uh, uh, sort of um, not uh, commonly seen uh, configurations of the joints in a rheumatoid arthritis patient. Now we treat these with massive immune suppressants um, including steroids and we also treat them with um, unique awesome drugs which I'm going to cover very soon in a later video that can target the inflammatory signaling that goes on particularly the cytokines that are released from the antigen presenting cells and the T helper cells to coordinate that immune response. If we can block those cytokines we can block the um, um, attacking of the joints of course it's not great to have a suppressed immune system and that can open you up to infections so there are pros and cons to this treatment um, but it's necessary and it definitely improves the quality of life um, if we can prevent the pain and the swelling that occurs during rheumatoid arthritis so autoimmune disease where a self antigen is recognized as a pathogen antigen and so again, these types just depend on the region. So in type 1 diabetes, um, 
the beta cells that produce insulin in your pancreas get killed by your innate immune cells including your cytotoxic T cells and so now you cannot produce insulin so you rely on you need insulin injections rheumatoid arthritis your innate immune cells are recognizing your cartilage particularly your collagen as um, a, 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 a pathogenic antigen so they're attacking your joints and lupus I talked about that it's actually proteins attached to your DNA that you start to recognize as a pathogen so you start to attack the DNA in your cells which is horrific um, and it causes varied symptoms sometimes it seems to present in the skin sometimes it causes neurological conditions sometimes it, it, it attacks other organs and this is why the, the TV show House always famously guessed that it might be lupus because its symptoms are, are so nebulous and so different between patients. And that's because all your cells have DNA, so it just depends on where the disease seems to manifest. Multiple sclerosis, your, your, your neurons have an insulin, uh, have an insulation around it to help that electrical conductance, um, and that insulation is attacked in multiple sclerosis by your autoimmune disease. And there are many, many more. In fact, we're learning that a certain percentage of people diagnosed with schizophrenia actually have an autoimmune disease for a receptor in their brain. It's quite a small percentage, but we're still finding that kind of stuff out. So there's autoimmune diseases um, all over the show. And they're really horrible. But up next is something that kind of relates to autoimmune disease. Up next, we're continuing how our immune system can go wrong, and we're jumping into allergies. Thanks, team.